So I guess we could probably start and um, so welcome. Welcome everyone to Deep Learning and Security, the workshop on Deep Learning and Security 2021. Um, this is the fourth year that we're running this workshop, and I have the great pleasure and honor to co-chair the workshop with Nicolas Carlini and Nicolas Vasi Laclu. And um, so let's get started. And I guess, you know, um, I hope that you've had a great conference so far, and I will just dig into the workshop today and tomorrow. And uh, so how did we get here? Um, I want to share a couple of stats with you guys. And this is, first of all, a worldwide community effort. And you'll learn why I mean that. And this is very important. And it's also pretty exciting. So uh, this year, we received probably a fewer submissions compared to prior years. You know, um, the pandemic had a toll on everybody, uh, but still very good submissions. So we received 14 valid submissions. Um, and uh, we ended up by accepting uh, six papers with an accepting rate of about 43%. Uh, papers were reviewed by uh, three members of the program committee on average. And the interesting thing is that, and this is really why I believe it's a true uh, worldwide community, um, because first you could see from the stats that uh, there was a good- uh, Sorry, Lorenzo. Yeah. We, st we still see your initial slide. Uh, at least I oh. don't see the other slides moving along. Okay, so let me ask other people. I can go back and then you see now the new slide? No, I just see the same loading. Uh, like the same, okay. same, welcome to DLS. Oh, uh, I guess someone else says they can see a new one. Okay, maybe it's just. Okay, let me maybe... just, let me just try. So I'll, you know what I do? You know, I'll just stop the screen sharing and I'll start it again. And. Uh, uh, sorry wrong share how about now uh, now it's good for me so maybe i guess maybe it was okay, okay some, okay. some yeah i mean it's uh, okay it's network of course you know everything uh, yeah, yeah. can falls can fall apart everything can fall uh, apart yeah thank so you so much interrupting no 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 worries no worries you know so we're trying really to solve very cool hot challenges here but i guess there is we're still relying on some you know ent high entropy um uh event that can happen anytime. So I wanted just to share with you guys that, you know, I'm, it's truly exciting to see that this is a, a really a worldwide effort. I mean, if you look at the stats, there is a, a little bit more predominance from North America, but we received submissions from people like really pretty much around the world. And the good thing, and I found actually this to be quite um, unique, perhaps to uh, DLS, is that we had a fairly almost uh, equal split between academia and industry participation uh, with lots of collaboration. So many papers were also collaboration between industry and academia. This is great. This is great because we're, we're really trying to tackle uh, security and privacy issues in machine learning, the focus on deep learning, of course. And this is truly an effort that requires uh, blue sky thinking, but also uh, always to keep in mind that there are some operational uh, practicalities. And it's great to see that there is a synergy between industry and academia. So this is really exciting. So um, I'm changing slide as well. <laughs> so ho hopefully, Nicholas, you will you see this. So um, we have really an exciting program. Of course, you go on the website uh, of DLS. All the time, all the timing is in uh, Pacific Daylight Timing uh, time zone. So and uh, first session at 10 a.m. from 10 a.m. to 11:30 uh, a.m. PDT, and uh, we have three great uh, papers lined up. Uh, talking about a little bit about how we can deal with uh, federated learning and also auto distribution detection and at the same time combating uh, mass robot calls uh, using deep learning. Then we're going to have uh, something between, of course, a break. Uh, and then from 1.30 to uh, 3 p.m., we're going to have a second session. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that first session, uh, Gang Wang from UIUC is going to be chairing that session. Uh, for the second session, I still uh, am not entirely sure who's going to share the session. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. Uh, and uh, we're going to have the second the second session. So here was originally I placed Corrad from Tube Braunschweig. Uh, Corrad can't make it. Um, so don't worry, uh, we'll find somebody to share the session. So we're also going to get uh, some other interesting papers here on protection on 
uh, deep learning models on Android devices, on an interesting data set uh, for Windows malware, trying to measure also time decays uh, over time, performance time decays over time, and also uh, black box attacks against the static malware detector, detectors using reinforcement learning. So it's a pretty cool program, pretty exciting program. Really happy to have this program here. But there is more. We're going to have uh, a keynote. Uh, so the first keynote is going to be from uh, Sadi Afro. So the keynote is going to be right after this opening uh, remark from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. PDT. And Sadia, um, she's a researcher, uh, a scientist, a staff scientist at ICSI at UC Berkeley and at Avast Software. And she's going to tell us uh, something about adversarial attacks but this time with a, with a slightly different flavor. So against commercial malware detectors. So again, this is interesting seeing how academia and industry, they look at the problem, they perceive the problem. So I'm really looking forward for this keynote. And wait, there's more, of course. So we're gonna have another keynote um, uh, at 12.30 uh, p.m. Uh, from Martin Betchett uh, from ETH Zurich. And also Martin is gonna be talking about something absolutely important. So how can we have certifications or certified, um, you know, how can we be sure that our classifier is robust against adversarial attacks and uh, in a certified way? So really, really um, important talk, this one as well. But there is more. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the lunch break, of course. There is more here. And uh, what I'm talking about is that also we're gonna have, I'm very excited to announce we're gonna have a very cool panel and of course, you know, you might uh, recognize Comic-Con here, never made it to Comic-Con, always wanted to go. And this is my homage to Comic-Con. So we're gonna have likely so entertaining and uh, expert on, on, the, on the panel. So we're gonna have a panel uh, that looks at, you know, beyond deep learning security, what do we need uh, to make machine learning trustworthy? So trustworthiness looks at not just about performance, but about other properties that are equally uh, important and sometimes contrasting at the same time. So it's going to be a very exciting panel. And here, um, all of this was possible because, um, oh, sorry, it's been my arrow in here in the middle. Uh, we're going to have a great moderator, Ram from Microsoft. Then we're going to have uh, Alexander Korolova from University of South California, Anupam Datta from Carnegie Mellon University, Kamalika Choudhury from UC San Diego, and Seth Mayo from Harvard and Wellingers. Uh, so we're going to be the panelists, and Ram is going to moderate uh, the panel. All of this wouldn't be possible without two great panel co-chairs, uh, Nicholas Papernot and Reza Shokri. So thank you for you guys uh, for this effort. And now the interesting bit, I guess that usually this is one of the interesting bit that people usually look after when going to a conference. Uh, so we're going to have breaks, of course, all the way through. Different breaks from what you usually have uh, when you have uh, uh, events uh, physically. Um, so in the program, we're going to have a welcome and opening remarks as we are going to have it right now. Then from 11.30 to 12.30 PM, so it's like be an early lunch. And uh, well, I said here, Sharon Slack, of course, not this. Um, is a testimony of my sleep deprivation and <laughs> there's no slack associated, but you can share it on Twitter, of course, you know, what you guys are having for lunch or depending on where you are in the world for snack or break. Uh, but this time, I guess that there's not gonna be any um, complaint about food. Uh, well, if there is any complaint about food, well, you should be reconsidering your, your options here. Uh, then we're gonna have uh, a break from 3 to 3.30. And then uh, Nicholas, I guess, is going to be uh, uh, wrapping up the workshop with some concluding remarks, closing remarks. So this is, let me just remark once more that this is really uh, something that is just been possible because of the great community we're part of. And uh, in the slide here, I would like to thank, of course, the Brown Committee members, but also all the other people that helped all the way through. So from general chairs, of course, you know, work, workshop organizers, uh, but also Nicholas, of course, you know, for taking the lead in, uh, in making DLS great. Uh, but more importantly, to you all guys, I mean, without submissions, there will not be any deep learning and security workshop. And so without attendees, there will not be anybody to disseminate this research uh, uh, breakthrough. So really thanks to all of you guys. And what I wanted to say basically is welcome to uh, DLS 2021. And now without any further ado, I guess we're 
kind of all time. Um, we have our first, sorry, our first keynote speaker, um, Sadia Afros from ECSI uh, UC Berkeley, and I have a software. And uh, the title of her keynote is Lessons from Adversarially Attacking Commercial Malware Detectors. And Sadia is a researcher at uh, ECSI and of a software. And her work focuses on anti-censorship, anonymity, and adversarial learning. Her work on adversarial authorship attribution received the Privacy Enhancing Technology Award and the ACM Sixact Dissertation Award as a runner-up. And you can find more about Sadia on the link to her website on the workshop webpage. So without any delay, we're still on time. Apparently, we're absolutely spot on. So Sadia, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for helping this set up. And thanks a lot, all the attendees, for waiting. Uh, so my name is Sadia Froes. I am a researcher at Avast. And I'm also affiliated with ICSI at Berkeley. And this talk is about my work at Avast. Uh, it's about our experiences of trying to evade commercial malware detectors using adversarial attacks. So next slide, please. So how do you do adversarial attacks against malware detectors? Uh, the basic principle is very similar to any other adversarial attacks. You start with a sample, and you change the sample until it evades detection. Uh, 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 Curly and Nicholas, you can go to yeah a couple of more slides. Uh, for a malware, a simple way to change the detection uh, is to add a new section or append something at the end of the overlay. And you keep repeating this process uh, until you evade detection. So this approach is exactly similar to any other adversarial attacks. So next slide, please. So at this point, uh, there's like about 2,000 papers on adversarial attacks in the image domain. Uh, the malware domain doesn't seem to be as popular as the uh, image domain. But there's still quite a few papers that showed uh, that uh, this kind of adversarial attacks can be quite successful at evading uh, malware detectors. Here in this table, I'm showing uh, only 20 papers that attacked Windows malware detectors. But there are also many other papers that evaded PDF-based malware uh, detectors. Uh, I'm not showing them here because in our attack, we only focused on Windows malware. Uh, what's interesting here is that not only uh, these papers can evade open source malware detectors, but they can also evade commercial AVs. And many of these papers tested, uh, uploaded their samples to VirusTotal and tested against real world AVs. And you can see also that uh, these attacks are quite successful at evading commercial AVs. Uh, I'm showing one result from a very recent paper uh, of uh, Dimitrio et al. Uh, where they have over 80% accuracy to evade commercial AVs. Next slide, please. So this result seems very serious, right? But if you go to the talks or if you read the papers, they often end like this, that our attack evaded company X's detector with very high accuracy, but we emailed company X and they don't seem to care. And this resembles our experiences too. I'll talk about it more later. Uh, here's a screenshot of the email we got from Juatel's uh, uh, talk uh, about their papers on evading Gmail's PDF malware detectors. We also have similar responses from the companies that uh, we attacked. Uh, I'm not showing them here because of privacy reasons. So in this talk, I'll mostly try to answer why. Next slide. So one reason this could happen, uh, adversarial attacks are not considered useful because that uh, many of the attacks don't generate functional malware. Uh, and some papers, in some papers, the attacks don't generate functional malware because uh, they do the entire attack in the feature space. They don't even create real malware. Next slide. OK, next slide, please. So this distinction between feature space attack and the problem space attack matters a lot, especially in the malware domain. Uh, because in the end, in the malware domain, we want to create an active malware that can actually infect users. Next slide. Uh, if we are only interested to attack, uh, uh, to, uh, to see if a changes in the feature vector uh, can evade machine learning model, changing the feature vector should be enough. But for a practical attack, we have to check if this changes in the feature vector also uh, translates to the problem space and can create an actual malware. 
So next slide. So now you might be wondering that if we are only adding something new, uh, for example, a, a new section and not touching anything else in the file, uh, why can't we do the feature space attack? That's because we have found that adding a new section can sometimes destroy a malware, especially in cases when the malware is a packed malware. Uh, this usually happens when a new sections override an existing section. Next slide. So here's, I'll give some two examples of why this happened uh, during our experiment. Um, next slide. So here I'm showing a basic structure of a Windows malware binary. And uh, these files have headers, there are some sections, and they end with overlay data. And sometimes when you add a new section, uh, without worrying about uh, how the file ends, this new section can um, uh, 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 overwrite the existing overlay data. And that could be problematic for some malware because some malware, uh, they are trying to be sneaky and they keep quite a, a, quite a bit of uh, their malicious functionalities in the overlay data that they load when the file is loaded in the memory afterwards. So if we override the overlay data, uh, it might destroy the malicious functionality of the malware. And in many cases, it can even destroy the, the file uh, getting executed. Next slide. Another reason uh, adding a new section could uh, cause a file to break is because when you add a new section, you also have to change the headers. And depending on uh, how big the section name was or section's property was, that could also uh, cause uh, uh, an uh, overridden uh, of, a, of an existing section. Next, next couple of slides. Yeah, I'm trying to show an animation here. And it can cause a, 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 cause a broken binary. Next slide. So this is why uh, we uh, wanted to do all of our attacks in the problem space. Event. There's definitely ways to uh, do this kind of adversarial attacks in the feature space and make sure that uh, we don't end up with a broken binary if you are aware of all the constraints. Uh, there's a good paper by uh, Lorenzo's group that talked about this, adding this kind of strength when you're uh, doing a feature space attack. Uh, but sometimes if you're not uh, too much familiar with the problem space, uh, having the right kind of constraint might be difficult. So the easiest is to do this attack in the, in the problem space instead of the feature space. So in the next couple of slides, I'll give you a brief overview of the attack that we tried to perform. Uh, to do our attack, we first define a set of actions that we will use to change a malware. Most of these actions are adopted from previous work. Um, and these actions are very simple. Uh, they add extra information, extra bits to the malware file. Uh, we can add a new sections. We can add a, we can rename a section. Uh, we do code randomizations where we replace instruction sequences with uh, semantically equivalent instructions. Uh, we uh, also had micro versions of each of these actions, um, where instead of adding uh, a, a more than one byte to a section, we add just exactly one byte. Uh, we have this kind of uh, micro, uh, micro actions because we wanted to pinpoint the exact reason why the evasion happens. This is important for us because our framework is a reinforcement learning based framework where we uh, rewarded each actions that caused a successful evasion. Uh, this kind of reward mechanism uh, helped us create a more efficient attack. Next slide. So uh, here's a demonstration of how uh, exactly our attack works. Uh, at first, we randomly pick an action from the action set. Let's suppose that new action is a new section, adding a new section. And then we uh, query a black box AV. If the AV considers this still malicious, we keep picking new actions from the action set and keep adding new actions until it evades uh, detection. So once we find uh, all a, a set of uh, actions that caused evasion, and then we look into how can we minimize all of these actions and create the, uh, the minimal version of the adversarial examples. We do this by uh, uh, removing all of those redundant features, all of those redundant actions. 
and coming up with the exact action that caused the evasion. So once we have this uh, exact action that caused the evasion, we replace this action with the micro version of the same action. Uh, here for overlay append, the micro version of the overlay append would be uh, adding just one byte of overlay. And if it still evades our classifier, then uh, we consider this as the uh, minimized adversarial example. In the next iterations of the same uh, same uh, class, uh, same detection uh, uh, creation approach, we will add reword to all the actions that caused a successful evasion, so that next time we can pick uh, the best uh, uh, best action that is more effective for creating uh, adversarial attack. Next slide. So now that uh, we uh, make sure. We only we change the malware file and we create a malware file to uh, that is an effective malware that can cause uh, 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 adverse uh, that can evade our detector, and that's not enough because we need to make sure that the functionality of the malware is intact after the adversarial modification. So to do this, we add a functionality verification uh, after we create an adversarial malware. Next slide. To ensure the functionality is preserved, we use uh, Cuckoo Sandbox. Uh, we run both the original malware and the minimized adversarial malware through Cuckoo, and we check the functionalities in both cases. If the functionalities are exactly the same, we consider that uh, the functionality is intact. Uh, we found that this functionality check is absolutely necessary uh, for creating a, an effective adversarial malware because we found that in many cases, when you just add a new section or add uh, append something in the overlay, that could cause uh, broken binaries. In our case, uh, uh, we found that 4% uh, of the cases, uh, uh, these actions could cause uh, broken binary. This is uh, definitely much better than uh, prior work, where we noticed about 54% of the cases, it caused uh, a broken binary. So this diagram shows the overall framework. Uh, uh, this work is a collaboration with UC Riverside. Uh, Wee Song was the main author of this work. I'm taking credit for his hard work. Our code is publicly available. I'll encourage you to look into it. Next slide. So we evaluated our approach using 5,000 malware from virus total. Uh, we were very careful at uh, selecting this malware file because we wanted to make sure that these are active malware that are um, detected by over 80% of the detectors on VirusTotal. Uh, we uh, tested five malware detectors. Uh, there were uh, two um, machine learning based open source malware detectors that we tested, Ember and Malcolm. Ember is an open source machine learning based classifier that uses tree-based classifier model to detect malware. Uh, it, uh, it creates a over 2,000 dimensional feature vector for each sample that consists of mainly two types of features, uh, raw features, for example, histogram type features, and parsed features, for example, general file information and header information. So it's a feature-based classifier. Malconv is a uh, neural network-based classifier uh, that uh, uh, gathers information directly from the raw bytes of the malware sample. Uh, we also tested three commercial AVs. Uh, these are static classifiers of top three commercial antivirus systems. We only use the offline version of these AVs. Next slide. So here uh, you can see the uh, evasion rate of our uh, attack for Ember and Malcolm. The green line shows uh, the evasion rate of our attack. And you can see uh, our attack is much more effective compared to previous work. We can uh, evade these uh, uh, classifiers um, with very fewer attempts than previous work. Next slide. When we tested the commercial AVs, our detection rate is, our evasion rate is not as high as the open source malware. But you can see, uh, even in this case, we can evade the AVs with 30% to 50% evasion rate. 
So next slide. So one of the reasons we want to do adversarial attacks is we want to figure out uh, the problems with our uh, classification system. And so we wanted to see that um, which actions are the most important actions that caused evasions and which features are, uh, are behind these actions. So for the two machine learning based classifiers, the most important action uh, turned out to be overlay attempt. Uh, other actions that only change a few bytes had almost no effects on them. So this shows that changing the data distribution seems to be the root cause of these evasions. Next slide. So adding uh, one, uh, one byte section seemed to be a significant uh, action for all the 80s. Uh, they were the reason uh, most, of the, most of the 80s most of the adversarial exams became successful. So compared to AV2 and AV3, AV1 seemed to be also vulnerable to uh, adding one byte uh, code section. So one byte code section changed the hash of the code section. So it seems that AV1 uh, used the code section hash as an important feature for detecting malware. Uh, we also noticed that uh, for AV2, section renaming one byte action generated many of the adversarial examples for AV2. Uh, and this seems very surprising that just adding one byte in the name of the section can evade an AV. So it seems AV2 relies heavily on the section name for detecting a malware. Next slide. So compared to AV2 and AV3, uh, adding section and overlay append seems to have no effect on AV1 but they seem to have a, a huge effect on AV2 and AV3. So based on all of those feature analysis, we can sort of guess that AV1 seem to be uh, using more signature-based approach for detecting malware. Next slide. So yeah, here, here's mainly, I'm explaining uh, all of those different features and how they affected our evasion. So here, uh, we, uh, based on the actions, we tried to guess which features might be in play uh, for detection uh, for many of these classifiers. Um, we found that for Ember and Malcolm that are open source machine learning based classifiers, the data distribution based features seem to have the uh, highest effect. For AVs, it seems uh, section hash and section count has uh, had a huge effect. And data distribution had some effect, but not that much. Next slide. So the next thing we wanted to see is to uh, is, is, is how easily and how many bytes we need to change to flip the label. If you remember, we had this action minimization step that can make sure that we always create a minimized evasive sample that can uh, only change minimum amount of content to flip the classification. So by checking how many bytes we need to change, we can uh, sort of infer the robustness of different malware, uh, different malware classifiers. Uh, uh, here, we also notice a difference between open source uh, machine learning based classifiers and uh, closed source uh, AVs. For closed source AVs, we have noticed by changing one byte uh, we can evade about one tenth of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, malware. One tenth of the cases we have noticed that uh, they evade um, these detectors by changing one byte. For Amber and Malcolm, we haven't noticed anything like that. So this kind of suggests that Amber and uh, Malcolm might be more robust. But as you can see, uh, the the uh, the detection of robustness is, is a bit complicated in case because Amber and Malcolm also uh, had a much higher evasion rate than the APs. So next slide. Uh, the next thing we wanted to see is the transferability of the attack. Uh, we are interested in this because uh, we wanted to see if an attacker can create a universal adversarial attack that they can use uh, to evade every other malware detector after uh, creating this attack using uh, these uh, sets of malware detector. 
but we didn't notice in our attack uh, the transferability uh, uh, that much because transferability was uh, much lower between AVs. The transferability between Malcolm and uh, Amber was uh, over over 10%, but for the AVs, the transferability was much lower. Next slide. So in this attack, we were only focusing on static uh, evasion. We were trying to evade the static detection, but we wanted to check if static evasion also evades uh, the dynamic detector. Uh, this is an interesting point that came up after talking with uh, different AVs, because it seems like uh, depending on uh, how the AV pipeline is constructed, uh, sometimes if the static uh, detector is uh, too confident about uh, the status of a file, it might um, it, it might declare a file to be benign and not do any of the later uh, more uh, time-consuming processing. So we wanted to check if an adversarial example that evades static detection also evades dynamic detection. So for doing this test, uh, we picked 30 ransom wire sample and we created adversarial samples for this 30 ransom wire. Uh, note here that the, this is just static evasion. And after we have a ransomware sample, we um, we uh, run we click and run them and try to see if they infect any machine. Next slide. So we were not expecting that any of this uh, uh, any of this attack will be actually useful because uh, actually work because uh, the static evasion detector. But we found for one AV our static evasion also evaded the dynamic detector. We contacted them and they suggested that it's because we were only using uh, the offline version of the AV. Uh, their cloud version of the AV uh, can do. So this also suggests kind of a potentially new attack where static only evasion can sometimes also evade the entire AV pipeline and infect users. So next slide. So our uh, academic paper ends here. Now internally, we took all of those adversarial examples and uh, we wanted to test two main things. Next slide. Uh, do they evade full static detection? And let's discover something new and interesting about our detectors. So next slide. So you, you can click through a couple of more slides because I'm doing an animation here too. So uh, a malware has to go through many different layers of detection before it is labeled as a malware. And the client side AV is just only a small part of that detection. Um, more uh, rigorous detection happens after, uh, after the file leaves the client side machine and in the cloud and in the backend. So next slide. You can click through all of, a lot of the slides, yeah. Next slide, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, in many cases, even static detection, there's only a, a fraction of the static detection that happens on the client side and a, a bigger fraction and more rigorous analysis that happens on the cloud side. In our case, all the adversarial examples that evaded the client side AV got trivially detected on the cloud side. And the reason is all of those adversarial examples were too similar to known malware. And uh, you can imagine this very, very easily because of the way we created these adversarial examples. We created these adversarial examples by uh, minimally changing known malware. So obviously when they were compared with other known malware, uh, they were uh, very easily detected. So this type of attacks uh, uh, could be could be very uh, very simple to do, and, and, and it, it's probably uh, kind of imaginable that this will happen uh, because the client side AV usually has uh, most recent signatures. Uh, so when we're in our case, we have noticed that uh, the uh, 
the adversarial samples that were able to evade the client side AV were old sample, uh, slightly old samples uh, for whose uh, for who the signatures were not present in the client side AV. But on the cloud side, AV has access to uh, many more sample and many more signatures, so they got detected on the on the cloud side AV. So another thing we have, okay, no, go back to the first slide, sorry, yeah. So yeah, so other interesting things we have noticed uh, uh, is that uh, uh, most of our successful evasion cases were unpacked malware. We, uh, using our uh, framework, we were not able to change uh, any packed malware. Uh, whenever we tried to change any packed malware, it caused uh, a broken binary and we had to throw it away. Uh, if you work in the malware domain, you probably know that real world malwares are all packed malware. So this unpacked malware are probably not the kind of malware any AV cares about anyway. Uh, so yeah, so in our case, we noticed that uh, this black box attack, adversarial attacks, didn't help us reveal any interesting things about our detectors because these malware detectors uh, have been attacked by real world adversaries for years. So they are already hardened against many uh, much more sophisticated attacks than the attacks that we have been doing. So next slide. Okay, so how can we do better? Uh, to be useful, uh, we probably need to do a different kind of adversarial attacks than the attacks you see in academia. One thing we have noticed uh, that white box attacks are more useful uh, than black box attacks. For white box attacks, you have access to the classifier, you already know the features, and you kind of have a, kind of have a guess about uh, where your classifier might be uh, uh, might be uh, not that robust. So knowing that if you create an attack, that can internally help you create better classifiers. So this white box attack papers, academic papers are great. Black box attacks are very hard to do without access to the entire AV pipeline. You'll notice that many papers use virus total to make sure uh, uh, that whether their evasive samples are getting detected or not. But virus total also does not have the entire AV. So just because you see uh, uh, your uh, attack evaded virus total detection doesn't mean that it actually evaded the entire AV. So this is in one way a good news. Uh, in many cases, we uh, go to this uh, adversarial attack sessions in conferences and we come up with this notion that uh, security, machine learning and security is completely doomed, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, antivirus companies have been using large-scale machine learning very successfully. And uh, as it turns out, all the academic attacks are not that useful to evade uh, those classifications. So next slide. So yeah, uh, if we want to do, uh, if you want to evade static detection, uh, one of the things we should do is uh, maybe try to create attacks that are not trivially similar to existing malware, that are uh, much more different, basically create a completely different malware. Because if they're similar to existing malware, we'll, they will get detected. Another thing uh, would be uh, to uh, create an attack that mimic real attackers. That would be very useful for any AV company uh, to see if uh, real world uh, things that are real world attackers are doing, uh, do they evade our um, uh, detection? Uh, there's been a couple of work that's been going on at Avast where we're looking at we're we're tracing the changes of uh, different malware families, and we are trying to predict how this malware family might change in the future. So this kind of uh, this kind of understanding of how families evade evolve over time would be very useful because this can help us uh, create proactive adversarial attacks that will help improve our detectors. Uh, another thing, another advice would be is to perform the attack in an in a even more real world situation. Uh, uh, in, in the real world, we have uh, one portion of the AV that is on the client side or on virus total 
uh, that you can query. But then you have another series of classifiers that are completely private, and you don't have any, any understanding of how those private uh, classifiers work. So can we create an attack that can evade a series of classifiers that uses different features, and some of them we might not have access to? Uh, one type of attack that might be useful in this area is uh, creating this universal adversarial triggers uh, that evade any kind of classifiers. Next slide. So, so far, I only talked about uh, static evasion. Uh, evading dynamic classifiers seem to be much harder. We have been trying to replicate some of the approaches that have been uh, proposed previously, but we were not very successful. Uh, one approach that's been proposed uh, before is, um, uh, uh, is where it's kind of a DOS type attack where you chop your target program into many different components and then you execute them in the context of other processes so that you hide the behavior of the original program in a stream of benign behavior uh, in, a, in a large number of processes. So this will overwhelm uh, your uh, dynamic detectors and it won't be able to uh, identify that you are uh, doing any malicious actions. Uh, so uh, uh, this kind of approaches has been shown to be useful for very simple malware, for example, keylogger. Uh, we haven't been able to reproduce this result for more complicated malware. Uh, so more research needs to be done in this area. Uh, another approach to try is, uh, is, to, is to combine uh, static evasion with other type of security attack, for example, DOS attack. Um, the dynamic detector usually has lower capability than the static detector. And the dynamic detector usually expects uh, to uh, examine fewer uh, samples than the static detector. Uh, but if we have a, a successful uh, evader of adversarial examples that can evade all the static detectors, then the dynamic detector might be overwhelmed and it won't be able to um, uh, detect all the malware on time. So that will slow down the dynamic detector and that might be another avenue of new attacks. So definitely lots of interesting things to do in this area. And I will end here. Nadia, thank you very much. Big round of applause. <laughs> so we should get it ready like with some recorded message, definitely. <laughs> um, so we have, um, we have some time actually to go over questions and uh, um, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A tab uh, under the session pane control that you have on the right-hand side of the hopping uh, UI. So I'm going to be reading them the way that I see it here. Um, so uh, first, I guess, uh, was uh, Jacob Bond. Um, and the question is, did you enforce using a minimum of actions through a penalty in the reward function? or by actively looking through the replays and performing ablation analysis? Uh, in the reward function, no, uh, no. We, we only had this like, uh, it, it was a constraint in our optimization function that as soon as we evade classifier, evade a classifier, we will just stop. Okay. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jacob. Uh, otherwise, feel free to follow up in the Q&A. Um, second question from uh, Shanghai Li. Uh, how do the perturbations in the feature space help or guide the changes made in the problem space? Or do you not use that information? So changes in the feature space can guide problems in the uh, changes in the problem space. Is that the question? Um, yeah, so I guess so. So uh, uh, Shang Yang uh, was asking um, whether uh, so how the perturbations in the feature space uh, help to mm -hmm. guide the changes made in the problem space. Mm -hmm. But the question continues to say, you know, or do you not use that information at all? Uh, we we did use that. So when we when we started doing this attack, like changing the malware file uh, takes a longer time. So uh, we tested. 
uh, the, the preliminary actions first in the feature space and then the actions that turned out to be useful we try to use them uh, and change the malware later so yeah so doing the attack first on the feature space it can be very valuable to understand what type of actions are even possible right. to do right because because if an action can't even evade a classifier in the feature space it's definitely not going to work in the problem space yeah yeah I agree. so this is what we also found in, in, the, in our paper that you were citing earlier that uh, yeah. uh, if we can find that and you can find an inverse an approximation inverse vision mapping then you can mm -hmm. craft a, a problem space attack yeah, yeah. Um, cool um, so next question is from uh, will Pierce um, how did you confirm that AV13 were using ml? Uh, I'm, I'm going to read the whole question, so maybe we yeah, can okay, just sure. so, so to give you a context. So and there are some questions. So, how did you confirm that AV one two three were using ML? What was the setup for testing the commercial AV products? Did you need to disable OS protections, smart screen, real time threat protections, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? So first is uh, how did you confirm okay. the AV one two three? No, we were using we didn't ML? confirm. Yeah, we we don't know, but that's just our guess since. You know, I, I, we work at an antivirus company, and uh, antivirus companies, uh, antivirus systems that are doing well, uh, the the amount of uh, malware they get every day, they have to use some sort of machine learning to deal with it. So I think at this point, all antivirus companies use some sort of machine learning. Right. Um, what was the setup for testing the commercial AV products? Uh, did you need to disable the, OS protections? Uh, we, I, I don't think we disabled any OS, OS protections. We just disabled uh, the internet and that's it. Right. Do you feel, so this is my, my, my personal follow-up, I interject here because mm -hmm. I have the mic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you feel that disabling internet actually affects the rest uh, of the uh, system? Because you know, internet behavior is, is an interesting um action that might actually influence all the other sort of uh um... yeah yeah probably it it definitely had some effect the reason we disable internet because um uh, every time we make any changes to the malware we were querying the we were running the av and this kind of behavior is considered suspicious from av's point of view if we had the internet we probably wouldn't be able to do this attack at all Oh, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's definitely lots of consequences because we uh, disabled the internet. Yeah, yeah. Um, checking the time, so we're we're, we're absolutely good. Uh, Gang Wang asking, um, have you analyzed the samples that failed the evasion? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you see potential reasons? If so, did you see potential reasons behind the failed attempt? Uh, so. There, there's two kinds of failing. Do you mean they failed uh, detection on the on the client side or on the AV backend side? Failed detection or failed evasion? Sorry. Yeah, I guess the guy, um, I'm not sure whether Gang is able to unmute himself. Um, Maybe he can just ask in the chat. Or he can ask in the chat and then um, I'll. Um, So let, let me, while we're waiting for, for Gang to answer, let's say both or either, <laughs> like mm. which perspective you feel is more oh, interesting so, to this? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. We uh, we analyze the samples that failed evasion. Uh, uh, many, as I said in my talk at the end, that we found that some of the malware, like for, for some files, we couldn't create an evasive version at all. And they later turned out to be packed malware. Right. Okay. And uh, yeah, at the, when we were writing the paper, we didn't care about it as much. But uh, as uh, when we were trying to do this attack uh, in the back end, we noticed that that you know, like no one cares about unpacked malware. Everyone cares about packed malware. So the fact that we couldn't uh, change the packed malware at all was a was a big problem for us. Right. Um, did you have did you experience any other failure that were not caused by uh, this? From the packing. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, for some malware, we notice that um, no matter how much we change, they just get caught. So, yeah. Because I also, I mean, this so, is... so, so I think I, uh, th there's certainly some limitations uh, uh, in the way the way we were doing this attack, right? We were adding new things to the malware. So if uh, some malware has a very definite signature of how it works, no matter how many things you add to it, there's always that signature sure. will always be present. Well, was caught, yeah. Yeah. So, and, so and, that and, was you know, one so, of the reasons. Sorry to follow up with what you just said. Mm -hmm. it, it, did you try because you said nobody cares about impact malware? But if you look this from the attacker perspective, say mm -hmm. somebody who has access to malware, mm -hmm. did you try to actually uh, perform any modification and then pack the malware afterwards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't tried that. Yeah, that's okay. a, that's an interesting thing. I think, and that would be, I think, a, a better way of doing the attack because uh, uh, the actual malware author, they uh, change the code, then they yeah. pack the malware, and then they yeah. uh, try to evade AVs. Yeah, so yeah. that's not yeah. what we were doing. We were trying yeah. to just, uh, uh, we were downloading the malware the way we find them on VirusOtal. And more adding, blindly, yeah, more yeah, blindly. Yeah, more yeah. blindly. So yeah, so yeah. I guess more informed attack would be a much better and more effective attack. Yeah. Um, so checking the time, yeah, we're good. Um, he Cheng Chen um, is asking, uh, why minimal? Uh, I like this question. So mm. I like all of the questions. Sorry, I should be yeah. super fun. It's very, I like all of it. So um, it resonates a little bit with what we've done in the past. So why minimal adversarial malware? Perhaps uh, they don't need to be minimal. Uh, mm. Do you know if the cloud side detected the adversarial malware by static or dynamic detection? Mm -hmm. uh... Cloud side detected adversary malware by oh by static. It's just by static. Yeah. So uh, uh, as I said, the thing we found that uh, since we were changing minimal minimally changing uh, malware, um, they were all got caught uh, by comparing them with other known malware. So yeah. So I, I think I think minimally uh, changing adversarial malware is not the way to go. We yeah. use this approach because that's the kind of the approach you do in adversarial learning, where you minimally change <laughs> a sample. But yeah, for the malware domain, we probably don't uh, shouldn't go in this minimal uh, change direction. I well, I, I'm trying. So I don't want to to steal the stage. It's your stage. So yeah, I agree. You, you should, you I, should no, definitely I agree. discuss no, no, we have I agree. time. No, yeah. I mean no no we, we did we did uh, so the paper you are the work we you, you were citing earlier, like we, mm. we did actually reason around the same uh, concept that maybe you don't need to be minimal here because it's, you don't mm. have an image or an audio stream mm -hmm. um, or an actual traffic. So you have other, other things that you might need to cons consider about like, you know, semantic equivalence, you know, the malware doesn't crash and stuff like that. So we did try this on Android, of course, you know, it might be slightly different because of binaries and stuff. But, uh, so Alina, um, Alina is asking, um, uh, is congratulating for the talk. Thanks for the interesting talk. And uh, she's asking, so uh, can you please comment on how your work is different from the work of Anderson et al. And it the is, work, uh, yeah, yeah I, yeah, I looked at it. Yeah, it, it okay, is very okay. similar. So they also use reinforcement learning, and we also use reinforcement learning. The only difference is that we were uh, keeping history of the uh, of the actions that were useful before, and this kind of reward mechanism made our attack more useful. And another changes we made is that. We were also keeping track of, so we were not only keeping track of actions, we were also keeping track of the content we add. We noticed different contexts have a different evasion rate. So uh, right. keeping track of the weights of the content and the action that it made our attack a bit more efficient than their attack. Right, thanks. Um, Um, Shengyan Li, no, sorry, I, I missed. Um, uh, Muhammad Ali Shafei is asking, do you think it's possible to represent the malware behavior by any means, like API calls as a feature space, apply small changes and produce new binary file to evade dynamic analysis? Dynamic analysis seems to be very hard to evade because, <laughs> because, uh, I, no matter what you do, you have to perform uh, the malicious functionality that you were trying to perform. And as soon as you try to perform it, 
you will get caught by dynamic set. So yeah, one one hypothesis that uh, uh, the the approaches that people have tried before is to uh, do kind of like a DOS kind of attack where you chop your program into many different pieces and then you execute them in combination with other processes and that might be the way to go. But uh, unfortunately, we couldn't reproduce that result for more complicated malware. Uh, this approach seemed to be working well for simple key loggers, but for more complicated malware, like uh, chopping it and then and running it uh, with other processes seemed to be very complicated. But definitely that could be a new direction, research direction to try. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Shang Yang Li is asking that to add to my previous question, many adversarial perturbations are done in the feature space first in studies. Mm. Uh, can this information be used? Yes, definitely. I guess this is similar to uh, a question people ask that if uh, uh, action does not work in the feature space, that's definitely not going to work in the problem space. So it's always a good idea try to do your attack in the feature space and then uh, use that information to change your problem space files. Because anyway, any any transformation you do in the problem space will have repercussions, so they correspond to perturbations in the feature space. And yeah, um, Gang Wang is uh, okay. So uh, he said, "Thanks, Adia. Sorry, I cannot find an audio function, and we'll need to fix that. I guess because Gang is going to be chairing the next session. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so hopefully, you know, to clarify." Uh, the evasion rate is not a hundred percent. So yes. I was mostly asking about the perturbed samples that are still detected as malicious by AV. Oh, oh yes, yeah. So, so those are these samples. Uh, uh, as I said, that there are definitely a packed sample that we couldn't evade. We couldn't change at all. Whenever we tried to change. It broke the binary, so we couldn't change them at all. So those are part of the samples. And the other samples where, uh, 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 um, uh, if you notice the, the way we did this attack, we were adding stuff to the malware. We were not changing the core malware code. So the malware for which the AVs have really good signatures, they were getting caught um, by those signatures. So just by adding random stuff to the uh, malware, would not uh, did not sway the AV for all the uh, all the cases. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, Shang Yan Li is asking: um, Can we reverse this information of such perturbed feature values to construct the desirable malware in the problem space? Yeah, I think I think that would be that would be probably a better way to go. Yeah, because uh, right now uh, the attacks uh, you see are too trivial and very simple. So yeah. maybe reconstructing a malware that looks different from known malware is a, a much better attack. There was a uh, like a, an additional comment, um, a follow-up, so but you asked for the question, so I guess, I guess mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're good anyway. Uh, so I guess uh, that if there are no, I, I had a question actually, so uh, a very quick one. So. Um, you show that at least for Ember and Malcolm, if I remember correctly, uh, the feature that contributed the most, uh, the action, or the features that contributed the mm. most to the misclassification um, or to the attack success rate was the data distribution. And yeah. uh, I, 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 I'm not sure whether I missed that from the talk, but what, what, what is it that you did change? Uh, oh, uh, we added, I think that was overlay append. So Malconf and Amber, they both uses data distribution, the histogram of bytes as a feature. So if you do of the whole, overlay, uh, yeah, of the, of, whole of, the, of the whole of the whole binary, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, but also because they are both Malconf and uh, Malconf and Amber, I don't remember Mal Amber, but Malcolm is a is a is a CNN, isn't it? Yeah, right. Yeah. So they, they, CNN, they treat and, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they treat that as an unstructured data. Yeah. While it is not in reality, yeah. but it's uh, okay. Okay, so all right. So it was great. So uh, thanks, guys, everyone, to participate. So I guess it was an, an interesting Q and A session. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And uh, thank you, Sadia, once again for um, accepting our invitation to deliver in this uh, fresh perspective on. And I guess you know we wanted to conclude also to ask you know how can we do to make these attacks more successful, but also defenses more robust. But I guess yeah. we cannot really say that in a couple of minutes, <laughs> so it <laughs> require a little bit more time. And um, so uh, thank you, everyone. And I guess now, so we're ready to start for the next, uh, so our session, session one. And Gang Wang from UIUC is going to chair the session. So Gang, I guess that you should be having a button somewhere like, you know, share audio and video. And if you click that, uh, you should be popping up to our own panel control. You can, we can give you power, I guess. <laughs> But I'm not. Let, let me let us know uh, right in the chat if this works or it doesn't work. If you don't have anything, and then we'll have, we'll have to fix it somehow. Thanks, Sadia. Thank yeah, you very so much. I'll, yeah. Thanks a lot yeah. for inviting me, and it Thanks. was great talking to all of you. Thanks a Bye. lot. Bye. Cheers. Yes. All right. So uh, now let me introduce you to the uh, second talk. Uh, so. Uh, Jose Yalom will, will be presenting uh, Safe Learn, uh, Secure Aggregation for Private Federated Learning. Uh, so take it away. Thank you. OK, perfect. Thanks a lot. I'm Jose, and I'm here to present our framework, Safe Learn, Secure Aggregation for Private Federated Learning. This is a joint work between uh, TU Darmstadt, F-Secure Corporation, and Google. Uh, before uh, going into details, uh, let me give you a brief outline of this presentation. This presentation. First, I will introduce the problem statement and the setting of our framework. Then a brief overview of our contribution will be explained. And this is followed by uh, presenting our framework, I mean SafeLearn, and benchmarking of SafeLearn and describe NESC. And I will conclude the talk with future works for safe learning. Federated learning is a concept for uh, distributed machine learning that links a number of clients and uh, an aggregator, and they collaboratively build a global model. First, we have uh, one aggregator. The aggregator select a sample of clients here, the clients in the figure are the Yasmins and Aladdins, and the aggregator is our magic. Then the clients download the current global model parameters, and then clients run learning on local training data. And after that, aggregator aggregates updates into a new global model and at the end they repeat these steps to achieve the end global model to achieve one convergence federated learning offers a lot of applications especially software diagnostics medical diagnostics google word completion and malware classification to name a few a real-world application for federated learning is Gboard. Gboard is a mobile keyboard for Android smartphones, and they use federated learning for training word suggestions. And for example, this application was downloaded more than 1 million until end of last year. But... Uh, Federated learning can achieve a lot of application for us, but there is some privacy issue here. And our goal is to learn only aggregated inputs in aggregator side, nothing else. We don't want to reveal individual inputs in client sites. And the reason of that, the first reason is some rules for more than 50% of countries like HIPAA, like PIPEDA, like GDPR, and like CCPA. 
and also in general when working with personal and sensitive data like healthcare we don't wanna reveal individual inputs and we need some privacy integrated learning for that there is some tools and they can achieve privacy for us they named modern cryptography Modern cryptography can be home of encryption or secure function evaluation. Talking about home of encryption, home of encryption is a public private key crypto system with the ability to perform computation on encrypted data. And HES schemes uh, are classified by the type of computation they can support. For example, SHE or somewhat uh, homework encryption support a limited number of addition and multiplication. But fully homework encryption support unlimited number of addition and multiplication. The second type of modern cryptography which we can use named secure function evaluation. In secure function evaluation, first we have some arbitrary public function f and we have some parties. Here we have two parties, for example, Yasmin and Aladdin. The parties uh, have some private data x and y and the goal is achieving the result of the function without using any trusted third parties. For example, here, the party one and party two wants to achieve the result of Z without revealing anything about their information. And secure function evaluation can be achieved using YAW protocol or GMW protocol. Okay. Talking about the federated learning and privacy in federated learning approach, until now we can say there is three different approach. The first approach is using encryption, using like homomorphic encryption techniques. But homomorphic encryption techniques are expensive and that makes secure aggregation using encryptions impractical and we cannot use them in real words at the moment. The second type of secure aggregation is using secret sharing. The main drawback here is run complexity. And for this reason, we cannot use the secret sharing in naive manner. The last approach is using some trusted third party the computation overhead is good and the run complexity also is good here, but we cannot trust to third parties. And the goal of safe learn is to provide good computation overhead, good run complexity without using any trusted third party. For example, in this table, we can see the comparison between safe learn and other approach. For example, uh, some of them need some trusted parties, which uh, we need some weak security assumption. And some of them are hard to extend to active security. And active security means the clients can do anything they want. And the passive security means the client follow the protocols, but they uh, try to learn some additional information. And we can, uh, we can uh, say most of the works has some bad run uh, communication and also they need some expensive operation and some of them cannot support their parts. And also we aware only with one work they are open source and in safe learn we provide all of them together talking about contribution we can say in this framework we have a protocol for secure aggregation 
with passive security, which means the client should follow the protocol, but they wanna try to learn some additional information. We have low communication, computation, and communication runs. And also, our protocol is flexible for all federated learning aggregation mechanism. It means we are not limited to one specific method. And we support the parts of clients joining and rejoining of clients uh, very easily. And also, our protocol is easy to extend to active security. And we can easily provide the active security. As I told, it means the client can do everything and we support it. Okay, about previous work, we can say they rely on a trusted third party. They didn't consider their apps. They need expensive cryptographic primitives and they need many communication runs. And for this reason, or Aladdin character is so angry about the previous works. So safe learn, we don't have any trusted third party. We don't need expensive cryptographic primitives and we support therapods. And also the safe learn is a generic design for private related learning. It can be instantiated with homomorphic encryption or secure function evaluation, and it can realize any arbitrary aggregation mechanisms and also or implementation are open source and others can use them. And so our Aladdin character is happy here about safe learn for secure aggregation. Okay, going for our protocol in safe learn as an example, we consider Fed average here. In Fed average, the global model is updated by summing the weights uh, received by the clients. I mean WI in line seven. In this slide, we have K clients and the goal is calculating GT, uh, a global model, securely. And we wanna calculate this line. So what we can do? As I told, for calculating the, uh, that line, we have two options, using homomorphic encryption or using secure function evaluation. To choosing one of them, we have some trade-off between security and efficiency. If you care about only security and you don't care about the efficiency, you can use HE framework like Microsoft HEC library. If you care about security and efficiency together, you can use ABY framework, a state of the art framework for two party secure function evaluation. And if we care about only efficiency and not security, we can use ABY TD framework for TD party secure function evaluation. In this work, we choose ABY framework because of good trade-off between security and efficiency. It means we care about security and, and efficiency together. Okay, because we use ABY, let's talk about what is ABY. ABY is a framework for secure function evaluation, they consider three different protocols. First, they consider arithmetic sharing. Arithmetic sharing is, uh, they, in arithmetic sharing, they have free addition and cheap multiplication and the bit operation are expensive there. They have Boolean sharing, GM, GMW Boolean sharing, the GMW Boolean sharing is very good for comparison operations and the XOR operations are free there. And the main bottleneck here is interaction for each AND gate evaluation. 
we can say the wrong complexity of AND gate is the bottleneck of GMW Boolean shading. And the last protocol is Yaw's garbage circuits. In Yaw garbage circuit, XORs are free again, like GMW. And we have cheap comparison and cheap bit operations. And the main bottleneck here is communication overhead. But Yaw garbage circuit is good for some primitives like division. As you can see, each protocol is good for some type of operation. So ABY provides some conversions between these uh, three protocols, six different conversions. And then we can use the com conversions between A, B, Y to provide the best performance for all primitives. So in SafeLearn, we use ABY in outsourcing setting, it means we have a lot of clients and two non-colluding servers. The clients can share the parameters with the servers and the servers can calculate the aggregation for us. And the good thing for outsourcing setting in ABY is the overhead, the computation and communication overhead uh, doesn't depend on the number of clients. And we can support something like million of clients in our framework. And also our implementation is open source. And in this link, the others can access to the code but it will be released uh, middle of June. Okay, as an example, as I told, uh, consider federate average. In federate average, the goal is uh, calculate this operation. So, first, we use the arithmetic shading to calculate a uh, sigma of WIs, the addition of the weights of the clients, but securely. Then we convert from arithmetic to your protocol, I mean from A to Y. And then we have the division using your protocol. And here we have our operations and we repeat these steps to achieve the end global model. We have only two run complexity and the reason of that is our conversion from arithmetic to Yao. And also, as I told, SafeLearn allows an arbitrary number of clients to drop out and rejoin. And the reason of that is the aggregator can simply adjust the division factor, I mean KT, by the number of clients. And for this reason, we support the therapists. And as I told, the safe learn can be used for arbitrary aggregation function, and we are not limited to only Fed average. For example, Kerom aggregation is, can also uh, be used in SafeLearn because the main operations in Kerom is argmin, multiplication, and addition operations. And secure function evaluation protocols can realize all operations. For example, we can use Boolean shading for bit operations like argmin, and we can use arithmetic shading for multiplication and addition. For this reason, SafeLearn can support all arbitrary aggregation function. And talking about the comparison of SafeLearn and previous fork, I mean asymptotic comparison, we consider uh, five previous forks which they consider therapods, and they are not based on computationally expensive homomorphic encryption. And we can say we have the best run complexity, the best communication and computation in client side because we use the outsourcing scenario. 
and the communication of the server side is also uh, better than the previous works and only the computation of server side is in one of the previous work from CCS20 is better than SafeLab. And for benchmarking, we use ABY, as I showed in the previous slide, because of the trade-off between security and efficiency. And we use PyTorch framework for uh, neural network training. And we benchmark our protocol over uh, local uh, area network, LAN. And for showing uh, the results, we choose three different applications, natural language processing, image classification, and network intrusion detection system. First of all, talking about the accuracy of SafeLearn, as you can see in the slide, the SafeLearn is accurate as the plane takes Fed average, for example, because we don't use any approximation in SafeLearn because secure function evaluation can evaluate any operation accurately without using any approximation. And that's the reason of our 100% uh, accuracy. So we don't have any problem for accuracy for filtered learning. And the next comparison is talking about communication. Communication in SafeLearn is about constant. For example, for NIDS aggregations, aggregating 500 models, the communication between the two servers is about 8 megabytes. And even for a very large NLP model with more than 20 million parameters, the communication is about 300 megabytes. And also our runtime, we can say the runtime scales linearly with the number of clients. For example, in NIDS, uh, NIDS application, aggregating 500 models takes less than one second. And in large NLP model, the aggregating uh, 500 models is take uh, less than 80 seconds in safely and that's fair enough because we provide privacy in federated learning okay to conclude this talk we provide a secure protocol for arbitrary aggregation function with passive security as i told it's very easy to extend to active security and we tolerate uh, the robots and we don't need any expensive cryptographic operations we don't rely on a trusted third party and for future work the first direction can be extend to active security and that's nothing because instead of using ABY we can use MPS speeds or scale mamba two different uh, secure function evaluation frameworks for active security and then we have safe learn for active clients the second direction can be scalability scalability i mean the number of servers for example if you want to consider 10 servers or 100 servers uh, you have some pro problem in sfe frameworks and they are not scalable and for data applications like distributed learning, something like uh, learning the global model between different hospitals, uh, we still uh, have some open questions to using SFE protocols. And the last, and I can, I can say the important direction should be combination of privacy and security together. At the moment, we only consider privacy and we don't have any security here. Security means the client 
can inject some poisoning data or some fake data to the aggregator. And the goal uh, can be considering both of them together to provide some uh, defense against poisoning attack and secure aggregation together. Okay, that was a safe learn, secure aggregation for private federated learning. And you can access our paper or codes. And I'm here to answer your question. Thanks a lot for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Hossein, uh, for the great talk. Uh, we have already two questions in the chat. I will read it to the audience. The first question is from Jonathan uh, Pettit. Uh, he was asking uh, on slides number nine, you said, uh, most of the existing frameworks are not open source. And Jonathan was mostly wondering why, uh, why they're not open source. Uh, you should ask the authors. I don't know. <laughs> but only I know about the batch script, the paper for, I think, maybe Usenix for 2020, they are open source. The other works, I can say I can, I couldn't find the code for them. I see. Uh, so another question uh, again from Jonathan. Uh, he was asking, uh, "Does it come? Is your implementation comes with an open source uh, uh, gobble circuit generator?" Um, that's the first part of the question. And the second part is, how often do you need to generate a gobble circuit? For any nonlinear operation like division, you have two options: using GMW secret sharing and using your gobble circuit. And because in federated learning, the run complexity is so important, we use the garbage circuit. Uh, wherever you have nonlinear, you need the garbage circuit. And for that, uh, we use the ABY because in ABY, they have the garbage circuit and you can simply instantiate it and we use it. All right, very cool. Uh, so since we started a little bit late, I, I probably can insert one question. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, so in your Thrive model, uh, do you assume the clients are uh, benign? So for example, if a client can get the global model and share with the attacker, would that change anything? Uh, at the moment, you mean uh, the client can collude with the servers? There is no problem because in our scenario, we consider the server can reveal the global model to the clients. And uh, they know I see. that. I see. But if you can do, if you want to do that, we, you can use SFE for all iterations. We go for iteration by iterations. That's I possible see. in SFE, but it's so expensive. Right. All right. Um, let's see if I have more questions. All right. I guess in the spirit of the time, uh, people can still asking questions in the chat. Uh, I think Jose can respond in the chat as well. Yeah, sure. uh, thank you again, Jose, for the great Thanks talk. So uh, Thanks. Uh, right. So it seems that Brody is also here. Uh, maybe we can get started with the second one. Okay, sure. Thanks for uh, that. Thank you. Hey, Brody. Uh, so uh, let's maybe you can try to test the screen sharing first, and in the meantime, we can get a second sure. one started. Uh, Sharing. Okay, there it's, we go. It's perfect. All right. Um, so All right. next, so next up, uh, we have Brody Coot from Palo Alto Networks. Uh, he will be talking about uh, innocent until proven guilty, uh, building deep learning models with embedded robustness to out of distribution content. Uh, Brody, take it away. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, uh, and welcome. Um, uh, this is uh, my presentation of this research, which introduces a deep neural network uh, learning framework, which we call IUPG, Innocent Until Proven Guilty. Um, as, as was mentioned before, this is a, uh, a joint effort uh, within Palo Alto Networks between our AI research teams and, and the web security research team. All right, so uh, to begin with, some intuition. Uh, for deep nets built for classification using standard categorical cross entropy loss or CCE loss, the network acts as a highly complex nonlinear mapping from some 
jumbled up input vector space into a k-dimensional output vector space where the k classes are linearly separable in the ideal case. By comparison, uh, IAPG learning works as follows. Uh, what we call target classes are immersed in a background of noise called, uh, which we call off-target data, such that their common identifiable structure uh, of, of the target classes becomes fully illuminated. In the ideal setting, the IAPG, the IAPG train network learns to map clusters of target data into single points in an output vector space with a margin of space around each point such that um, all samples which map close to that point belong exclusively to the desired uh, target label. So the ideal mapping for target data is explicitly resistant to noise and out of distribution OOD inputs and that uh, off target data, no matter what it is, gets mapped anywhere else in the noise cloud, exactly where uh, is unimportant. So uh, during inference, DNNs trained with CCE, uh, they implicitly assume that each new sample uh, belongs to one of its uh, trained classes. Uh, so there's no built-in capacity to recognize uh, unknown features or uh, any sort of OOD features of the input. Uh, so for example, when a sample comes in that doesn't belong to any of the classes that you trained on, uh, the result is basically just undefined behavior. And oftentimes, uh, deep nets are notorious for having really strongly confident um, responses to these OOD samples. Uh, so during inference with IEPG, uh, each sample is assessed for the uniquely identifying common structure of its target classes. And if a common structure is found, then it will map to the associated target point in the output space. Um, the, so the network is explicitly trained to minimize the sensitivity to all structures outside of those which are uniquely, uh, which uniquely identify its target classes. So there's a, there's a natural solution for OOD features and also you know, OOD samples in, in whole. Uh, these will simply map somewhere in the noise cloud. Again, we don't really care where, as long as it's sufficiently far away from our, our target points. So in the context of uh, malware classification, the structures that we search for are uh, specifically the positively identifying uh, malicious patterns, uh, while we ignore all other content that isn't directly associated with malicious behavior. So the samples are considered, in this sense, the samples are considered innocent until proven guilty, which is you know, where that name comes from. So um, IEPG makes special differentiation between classes with and without uniquely identifiable structure, which I sort of already been talking about here. So CCE loss, uh, it, it effectively treats all classes as inherently the same. It assumes that all classes have some kind of structure which can be identified and used to discriminate it against all other classes. Um, however, very often in machine learning, we train classifiers with one or more uh, structureless classes with a, with a high degree of entropy. So in the pictured example, uh, imagine training a, a cat or not cat classifier. Uh, all cats are gonna land on one side of the boundary while everything that is not a cat lands on the other side. Any features of your training data uh, that's picked up on as being indicative of not cat is likely just a result of circumstance in, the, in your training data. Uh, this is basically just overfitting, right? So attempting to model not cat as a class with uniquely identifiable structure is inefficient at best since no finite sample can realistically capture a glimpse of the entire distribution. So at worst, this is potentially dangerous when, um, as is often the case, uh, the sampling procedure used to populate train validation and test splits is the same. So in this case, uh, bad signals or you know, uh, irrelevant signals in the unstructured class can be picked up during training, but then still lead to good test set performance. But once you deploy this model in the real world, 
uh, when your sampling strategy is uh, assumingly different and these, these signals, uh, these irrelevant signals in the unstructured class are no longer present, you can be easily confronted with poor performance and also susceptibility to adversarial attacks, which I will go into shortly. So IUPG loss, uh, alternatively, it has special treatment of all off-target samples. Basically, uh, their class membership vector is the zero vector for every off-target sample. They have no dedicated class. Uh, we explicit, so we're, we're explicitly avoiding using any of the representational resources of the network to model them at a high level. Um, however, it, it's not that we just throw them away. They're still important. Basically, the off-target data helps to chisel down the learned representations of the target classes uh, to that which is truly inseparable, unique, and robust to accidental activation. Okay, so in the context of malware classification, so if you consider everything that you can possibly do with software, all of the malicious things you can do have a very structured and recognizable organization about them in comparison to everything else which is inherently benign as long as it isn't malicious. So maliciousness and subclusters of malicious patterns in source code uh, or, or binary files or whatever you're uh, trying to classify, that's the true target that we're after uh, with malware classification, uh, what, what we're arguing. So benign data uh, is inherently random and structureless, right? And there's no possible way to amass uh, a finite data set that covers the entire distribution of all possible benign inputs. Uh, uh, yet traditional classification strategies, particularly with rhetorical cross entropy loss, uh, they'll try to force the model to pick up on indicators of benignness in its training data uh, in order to classify those samples as such. Uh, so basically we're arguing that this does more harm than good uh, for the sake of vulnerability uh, to attacks as well as real world real world classification performance. So an important detail in all of our malware classification experiments is that we define the benign class as the off target class. So this helps to ensure only the pertinent malicious structures are learned while uh, robustness to all benign structures is embedded uh, into the network itself. Okay. So I'll now pivot to talking about uh, an overview about how IPG is designed to produce the kind of behavior that I've described. Um, so pictured here uh, is basically, it's the entirety of the novel components of the IOPG learning framework. Um, all of the components are built around an abstracted network architecture uh, script N. So N is allowed to vary freely in terms of the types of layers used, as well as the overall topology of the network just based on problem relevance. So IAPG, we specifically designed it to work as like a, uh, a drop-in replacement for uh, CCE. So we designed it such that it can, be tr uh, it can be utilized in the same, with the same networks and the same problem settings that you would otherwise use CCE. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain the reason for that in a second. So uh, we start with a Siamese-based architecture, but instead of comparing two inputs with each forward pass, uh, we introduce a set of learnable prototypes denoted here as capital P, um, whose job are to summarize the exclusive features of each target uh, class or cluster. And I say class specifically or cluster because um, semantic similarity can be present beyond just the class labels, right? So for instance, a cluster of visually simu uh, similar malware could all be obfuscated with the same obfuscation strategy, um, yet all malware will hold just a simple malware class tag along with every other malware, um, you know, as is often the case when we're training uh, binary malware classifiers. Uh, so in this, in this scenario, multiple prototypes for the malware class, each initialized to different malware clusters. Uh, this generally benefits training uh, in our experiment, uh, in our experience, based, uh, both in the overall training time, so it converges much, much faster, 
and we also usually end up with a better solution. Okay, so with a single forward pass, uh, one input is always a, a real sample X, uh, and the other input is the set P. So we're comparing X with the entire library of prototypes uh, with each forward pass. So each prototype in capital P exists within the same uh, space as each income, incoming X, which is denoted here as uh, capital I. So if I is uh, you know, 28 by 28 images, then every P, every prototype will map to a 28 by 28 image uh, before processing with uh, N, the network. So we've experimented with defining each prototype as directly a member of I, um, and also as a linear combination of training inputs, which form a basis set uh, denoted capital B. So in this, in this simple illustration, I is uh, four by four vectors of floats, right? So both prototype definition strategies would be akin to uh, defining each prototype as a 16 point uh, 16 floating point weights as in option one so it's just directly a member of I and we're learning you, you know we're learning those 16 floats floating points weights directly or as uh, each P would be defined as three floating point weights in option two uh, and these weights are used to linearly combine a basis set of three static training points so uh, option two uh, is it reduces the number of learnable parameters considerably, especially when I is really large, like in most you know, real world problems. Um, and this has allowed us to scale. Option two has allowed us to scale to using a very large number of prototypes in some of our experiments, like in the hundreds. And actually, this has benefited performance a lot um, in some problems. So, um, Comparison between input and prototypes uh, is accomplished with the following components. So uh, firstly, uh, with the output vector uh, representation of uh, at the end of the network N, we have one final fully connected layer that maps vectors into a new vector space, which I denote uh, with U. So when training a network with CCE, the dimensionality of U would be equal to the number of classes, right? This is this would this would be the the final mapping and where we actually compute the softmax and we compute the loss. Uh, but with IPG, uh, we can make the dimensionality of U denoted here with K uh, to be anything that we really want. We don't really have a limitation. Um, so distance. Uh, this is just the way that we did it because it seemed to work the best for us. We compute it as an L1 distance with a vector of learned weights applied to each dimension, uh, which I have pictured here. So we scale the elements of alpha, the weight vector, uh, with EDX just to prevent negative distance computations. So uh, the range then is zero inclusive to infinity. And then we squash the distances to lie within zero inclusive to one exclusive asymptotically. Uh, with an adjusted sigmoid function. Um, also, you know, hyperbolic tangent could also work here. Uh, this helps us focus on the relative closeness of objects in U instead of uh, penalizing arbitrarily large distances, which are unimportant to quantify. So we compute the distance between X and each individual prototype uh, there's a row of them here in this formalization. So this brings us to capital D, which is a vector of row distances between, uh, you know, squashed between zero and one. All right, so then we compute the loss pictured below with D. Uh, with, with D along with the class membership vectors uh, Y, uh, and then the also prototype to class membership vectors omega one through rho. Um, I'm just going to describe the intuition with the law, uh, for the loss without digging deep into the mechanics, um, just for time considerations, because I see we're already at like 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, at a high level, um, IUPG loss is, it's just a synchronization of uh, pushing and pulling forces 
between samples and prototypes in the output embedding space. So IUPG loss, it, uh, it pulls prototype embeddings and embeddings of their class members together while simultaneously repulsing all other prototypes. Um, for off-target data, uh, all prototypes are repulsed. Uh, so the minimum state is what I illustrated before in the ideal case in the beginning, uh, where prototypes and target members map uniquely, uniquely to a single point with a maximum margin. Um, importantly, which I mentioned before, we can have multiple prototypes per target class. This benefits us a lot. Uh, so we have a winner-take-all mechanism within classes, uh, within target classes, where only the closest prototypes for each target class will be acted upon. So this minimizes the distance to the closest prototype of the correct target class while maximizing the distance to the closest prototype of each incorrect target class. So the same is true for off-target samples their distances to the closest prototypes of every target class will be maximized. Okay, so for our main results, we have, uh, so we've made use of five data sets. Uh, the first two are the very famous MNIST handwritten digit recognition benchmark, and it's more challenging counterpart fashion MNIST. Uh, thirdly is a binary JavaScript malware data set used, you know, this is a data set that you uh, could use to train a generic malware classifier model. Um, in this data set, the malware is primarily sourced from VirusTotal, while the benign JavaScript is primarily sourced from uh, Tranko list. Fourth is a multi-class data set with nine isolated malware families, uh, JavaScript malware families. Um, these nine families are uh, associated with, uh, you know, they each have a, a unique target class, they're each unique prototype. Um, fifth is a binary URL data set, uh, malware data set. Uh, and the data here is pri primarily sourced from static and dynamic URL filters, uh, from Palo Alto networks, as well as external sources like VirusTotal. Um, as I mentioned before, in the context of malware classification, uh, we define benign as the off-target class, uh, right? So we don't designate any prototypes for the benign class, and every benign class or every benign sample uh, for every benign sample, the class vector is the zero vector. So malware class, uh, the malware class receives one or more. Uh, but typically many prototypes to exploit malware subclusters. Um, and we discover these subclusters offline beforehand just through standard clustering techniques. Uh, specifically for us, we ended up using, uh, I think it was like K-means++ plus plus for uh, uh, JavaScript and URLs. All right, so uh, for each data set, we compared training the same network architectures with IUPG and CCE. All common hyperparameters between the models were optimized for CCE and held constant for the sake of valid comparison. Um, all of the weights are initialized randomly for both networks, with the exception of the initialization of the prototypes, um, as I just mentioned, which were discovered through clustering. Uh, for multi-class problems, we only experiment with one prototype per class, uh, but for the binary malware classification, uh, you know, we used uh, we use multiple. So for um, for JavaScript, we were using like under ten because each prototype was defined uh, directly as a member of I. But for URLs, uh, we defined up to you know hundreds of prototypes, particularly because in the URL data we see lots of small like mini clusters, uh, which we hypothesize the reason is why uh, you know, this is the reason that um, uh, we saw much better performance upon initializing many many clusters or many, many prototypes. Uh, and we use the basis set definition of prototypes for the URLs specifically uh, uh, because without it, we, you know, the number of learnable parameters would have just exploded. So the general experimental outline uh, is uh, basically we compared the classification performance on a held out test split, as well as trying to fool both networks with 
certain kinds of noise-based adversarial attacks and feeding in uh, OOD inputs and looking at the uh, false positive uh, responses. Um, so more details about the different actual network architectures that we trained can be found in the main paper. But in general, just for this purpose, uh, each model takes the form of a state-of-the-art convolutional neural net designed for either natural language processing for JavaScript and URLs or computer vision for our uh, image data sets. Um, let's see if, well, yeah, this was originally a video. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, on the right here, if this actually plays, uh, so you're seeing the output vector space of IUPG uh, while training on MNIST without any off-target data. Um, so in order to make this possible, we set the dimension of U just equal to 2, and we also replace the distance function just with simple L1 distance because it's easily human interpretable. Um, on the left, we used uh, TSNE to visualize the output vector space of our multi-class JavaScript malware cluster once uh, training had completed. Um, you can see data of each, uh, you can see data of each target class is tightly packed around its designated prototype, uh, while benign data is mapped more arbitrarily toward the center uh, in a place that maximizes the distance uh, to all prototypes. And you can see in the video here that the target data of each digit is uh, sort of clustering around its designated prototype. Um, skip to the end here. You know, you can visualize here where each, uh, you know, all of the, all of the target data is mapped around its prototype. Okay, so um, I don't have time to discuss all of the results of the paper, uh, but here are the key takeaways. So firstly, um, the classification performance on the test set appears to be stable or increased upon switching from CCE to IUPG. Um, so we specifically focused on the recall of our models while the false positive rate was thresholded to be a very, a, a very low constant rate. So for example, at the 0.01% false positive rate level. Um, you know, this is quite common in uh, industry uh, just due to the, the cost of uh, false positives. Um, so it, for example, at the 0.01% false positive rate, uh, we, for a binary JavaScript malware classifier, we saw the false negative rate reduced from 3.5% to 2.82%. Uh, uh, and we also saw a smaller level of variation. Uh, the variation for the CCE network was 0.23, but for IEPG, we saw 0.17, which suggests more stable training. Um, so we saw consistent results uh, across all of our data sets and all of our models, including different usages of the off-target class, specifically for the, for the computer vision data sets. So for example, we tried training with, uh, without any off-target data, we tried training with Gaussian noise, and then we also tried training with images of random strokes uh, for the off-target class. Um, but I'll mention that the most strongly increased classification performance was observed with our malware classifiers in particular, um, you know, and we attribute this to our unique treatment of the benign class. Um, secondly, uh, we experimented with both models' tendency to produce false positive, uh, false positives on the OOD inputs. So we found a roughly 50% decrease in the false positive rate over OOD data from various sources um, across our data sets when the decision thresholds were configured to meet normal performance criteria um, on in-distribution test data. And again, we, have, we hypothesize that this is primarily provided by you know, stricter, more airtight models of our structured classes. <clears throat> uh, so thirdly, we looked into what's known as recency bias. And actually, I, I noticed we're running low on time, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, so I, wanted, I want to talk more about the, the fourth, uh, fourth experiment here, uh, which is related to the adversarial resistance for our JavaScript models. Um, and I'm going to talk more details because we feel like these are the most important results of the paper. Uh, so we tested 
a benign append attack as well as what's known as a fast gradient sign method attack or FGSM. Uh, so a benign append attack, um, it's incredibly simple, uh, yet it can be often fool even extremely accurate malware classifiers. So really quick, the idea is just to take some kind of malware and append a bunch of benign noise onto it that doesn't interfere with the functionality of the, the, the malicious code. So models that have overfit to indicators of benignness can easily pick up on this noise and get fooled into thinking the file as a whole is benign. And there's no limit to the amount of benign noise that one can append onto the malware. And in general, the more noise there is, the more effective is the attack. So this is particularly worrisome because of how easily this attack can be employed in its basic form. Um, so there's no need to obtain any intimate model details or even model outputs as is required for more sophisticated attacks. Um, and critically, we also see this kind of evasion technique is frequently observed in our real world traffic. Uh, we see this particularly in the form of malicious injections into benign libraries. Um, so uh, in our experiments, uh, the benign, uh, when we simulated our benign append attacks um, for, our, for our JavaScript cl uh, malware classifiers across both the multi-class and the binary classification tasks, we observe up to a full order of magnitude less flipped malware verdicts upon appending random benign fragments. So in each cell here is the percentage of malware whose verdict, uh, verdict flipped to benign upon the append. So it was originally correctly classified as malware, and then it flipped to benign upon appending a random benign fragment. And we included 20 different random fragments per malware just to ensure the stability of the result. So uh, with the largest fragments that we've tested, um, uh, under adversarial training, we, we basically we just uh, trained with uh, malware that had been appended. Um, the binary IPG model's verdict was flipped about 5% of the time, while the CCE model still suffered failure over half the time. Um, and we, we trained with fragments of about 5 to 10K characters. <clears throat> so you can see the CCE remains robust up to about 10K. Um, in that row, we see like 6% failure. But then after 10K, basically what it trained on when we scale up to 25, 50, 75, and 100, you know, it, it, it explodes. Um, another thing to note here in general is just the importance of training on adversarial inputs. So not surprisingly, both CCE, CCE and IEPG did much better when training on those perturbed samples. Uh, and the, the ones, the, the models which were trained with adversarial training uh, are indicated here with the, with the double cross. Okay. So really quickly, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, know about FGSM. It's probably the most famous example of an adversarial attack. Um, uh, basically, this kind of attack requires intimate model details that aren't typically released to the public with proprietary defenses. Um, you know, but it's, it's still an important theoretical weakness that we should experiment on. So when we put our models to the test, we see new errors being produced upon FGSM perturbation by a significantly lower margin with IAPG. So this was particularly true in the upper plot when no adversarial training was done. This suggests that IAPG <clears throat> provides an increased durability against these noise-based attacks, uh, so-called like out of the box. But unsurprisingly, both models still greatly benefit from FGSM adversarial training in the lower plot. In both attack types, uh, the benign append attack and FGSM, um, CCE with adversarial training outperforms IUPG without adversarial training. Um, however, IUPG combined with adversarial training is the optimal choice for both settings. So in closing, I want to emphasize this point that for future work, combining IUPG with known adversarial learning uh, and also like OOD detectors, et cetera, this appears to be the clearest path towards real world success. Right, IPG is designed to be a drop-in replacement for CCE. Um, thus, we can apply the vast, you know, the vast heap of literature on adversarial defenses and OOD detectors that are originally built around CCE. We can apply it to IPG in the same fashion. And so far, our results suggest that we can expect a greater um, margin of success. All right, thank you everyone for listening. I hope I'm not too over time here. Thank you, Brody. Uh, so yes, we are a little bit over time, but I think we can have uh, one quick question. But I 
uh, encourage you to answer the rest of the questions in the chat. Of course. Um, yeah. So the first question, uh, let's look at the one from Jonathan uh, Compton. Uh, so he was asking the overall concept sounds very similar uh, to uh, a, a paper published last year, I think. It's called a certifiable taboo trap, and he includes a link. Did you happen to read that paper before and quickly provide a clarification? Um, I can't say that I've read that exact paper before, um, but there are many works on prototype-based uh, deep learning strategies that are interesting. Uh, we, in our paper, in, in the main paper, in the related work section, I gave an overview of a uh, number of prototype-based uh, learning strategies and how they compare to IUPGs that might also be useful. There's other things that are also you can draw comparisons to, like deep metric learning is another interesting field that has some comparisons. <clears throat> but yeah, we can talk more about it in the chat here shortly. And also, I recommend reading the related work section of the main paper. Sounds great. Um, so there's another question from Ad, but in the spirit of time. So I, I do hope you can answer the questions in the chat uh, you know, sure after thing. this. Thank you so much, Brody. Thank you as well. All right, next up, we have uh, uh, Sharbani here. Uh, so Sharbani, would you mind testing the screen sharing really quickly sure. uh, so that we can make sure uh, people can see our slides? Can you see my All set right. of lights? Yes, looks perfect. Awesome. All right. So uh, next talk uh, will be about applying deep learning to combat massive robot call. Uh, this is from uh, Shabarni uh, uh, Pendit from Georgia Tech. So please take away. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation today. I'll be presenting our joint work uh, named Applying Deep Learning to Combat Mass Robocalls. This is a joint research uh, by me, my advisor, Mustak Ahmed, Junan Liu, and Roberto Pertisi. Uh, I, I guess everyone in this call and almost everyone we know do get robocalls. Some of us get them every day, and it, it it's there's no stopping it gets very annoying very quickly in 2020 you may estimated that there just in february there were about 4.8 billion robocalls in the usa and it's been going on all around the world and there has been a lot of call blocking applications like uh, you caller true mail uh, sorry true caller you mail things like that however uh, we don't know how good how effective they are and do they actually work and uh, in the scope of uh, robocalling ecosystem we do see tons of different types of robocalls like google listing free cruise irs support things like that so do this robocalling or call blocking applications actually work. Now, most of this call blocking applications rely on blacklist, either static or dynamic. And these blacklists rely on historical data like user behavior, uh, phone numbers that were uh, seen before making a lot of calls, phone numbers that were being reported a lot. And a previous study has shown that uh, black, these phone blacklists can only be somewhat effective, like about 55%. And uh, their effectiveness further decreases with caller ID spoofing. And in recent robocalling ecosystem, uh, most of the robocall, a majority of the robocallers are relying on neighbor spoofing. So neighbor spoofing is when the caller's uh, area code or the first four digits is same as the callee's area code. So you see a phone number come, you see a phone call coming from a caller ID, which has a similar phone number to, to you. And uh, it's more likely that uh, you're going to pick that up. So that's the technique they use to uh, make their victims fall for them. And uh, as I've mentioned that with these blacklists uh, that call blocking applications are using, uh, their effectiveness uh, is not that great and they perform poor, poorly as caller ID spoofing increases. So how about caller ID authentication? 
if we make sure that the caller ID that says it is, is actually the caller ID, then that then the problem goes away, right? But it, it doesn't. Uh, IETF proposed shake and steer protocol to uh, enforce or, or to implement caller ID authentication. And there has been a lot of research work as well on caller ID authentication. And caller ID authentication will likely reduce the number of robocalls. Uh, FCC has mandated all carriers to support this protocol by uh, mid of this year. And a lot of carriers like AT&T and T-Mobile are, are doing it right now. However, uh, this is not a cure-all solution because what if most of the scammers are operating outside of U.S. jurisdiction? And what if victims continue to fall for the scams uh, for the attackers that don't use color ID spoofing? And uh, what if the attackers are using these uh, one-time use phone numbers and calling them and throwing it away and they can cheaply acquire such phone numbers and uh, make their victims or make their victim base very large? We have seen that an email spam, uh, spam filtering has been very successful. Nowadays, uh, we rarely receive email spams. And even if we do, the popular uh, email applications that we use are very effective in uh, identifying a spam versus non-spam email. And one of the main reason is uh, they have a big advantage, which is they know the content of the email beforehand. So when the email spam filters, uh, these algorithms and these techniques, they do use the content of the email to label an email as a spam or not. However, it is more challenging for phone calls because uh, you don't know the content of the call unless you pick it up. And once the user has picked up the call, the user is already exposed to the malicious attacker. And there is a chance that they might be uh, attacked or, or they might be abused or they might lose money and time. And we've seen that uh, there were recent studies that billions of dollars or billions of revenues were lost due to these uh, spam or scam robocalls. And since we can't use call content before actually exposing the user to the attacker, it's really difficult or challenging to use call content to uh, filter out spam versus non-spam. So this is where we come in with our proposal or in this paper, which is we introduce a virtual assistant. Uh, you can think of the virtual assistant similar to a personal secretary who picks up calls on your behalf, makes an interaction uh, with the caller. Based on the interaction, decides whether uh, it's a wanted call or an unwanted call. So maybe someone who knows you from a seminar is calling you. It's more likely that it's a wanted call. However, a call about a free cruise to Bahamas is definitely or most likely going to be an unwanted call. Now, there are some current uh, call screening methods uh, commercially available in the market. Now, there are some uh, similarities and differences with the virtual assistant idea that we propose, and I'm going to talk about that in details. One call screening, one such call screening uh, option is Google's call screening feature. Uh, they released it in 2019 in their Android phones. So instead of just having an answer and decline button, now you have an additional option of screen call. So when you press that button, what's going to happen is uh, your phone rings, you press the screen call button. Google Assistant is going to pick that call up and uh, say something like uh, the person you're use uh, the person you're calling is using Google screening service uh, please say your name and why you're calling and whatever the caller says is going to be transcribed and shown to the user on their phone or whatever device they're using and then the callee can have more options like asking Google Assistant to say tell me more or I'll call you back things like that now, one stark difference here is that uh, Google's call screening feature does not do any kind of filtering. So it doesn't make any decision based on the content or based on any metadata and decides that this is a robocall or, or this is a wanted call or unwanted call. 
And one other important uh, aspect here is the user is very much involved. So every time your phone rings, you you are made aware and you have to make that decision and you have to be in the loop, read the transcript, decide what you want to do, decide if this, this actually does seem like a wanted call or an unwanted uh, call. So it put it puts the user in the loop and the user has to be very much involved and the, and Google Assistant is not uh, doing any filtering on behalf of them. However, uh, with the virtual assistant that we propose, uh, with every unknown incoming call, the virtual assistant picks up the call without making the user aware makes a conversation and decides uh, based on that conversation, whether it's a wanted call or unwanted call. And then if it decides that this is a wanted call, it will make the phone ring and show the transcript of the conversation. So the user has prior knowledge before they're actually exposed to the call. On the other hand, if the virtual assistant decides that this is an uh, unwanted call, it's gonna block the call, meaning it's not gonna let the phone ring but it's going to pop up a notification saying that this uh, call was blocked and here is the transcript of what the caller said or what the conversation occurred. One other such call screening method or similar to such call screening method is RoboKiller. Now this is a commercially available app. Now they do not uh, actually host a virtual assistant or they do not uh, propose a virtual assistant. What happens is all calls are forwarded to a centralized server and uh, calls are picked up and audio analysis is performed to detect robocallers. However, this experience is not natural for human callers because uh, your phone is forwarded, your phone call is forwarded to some server and you just hear a ringing tone for a very long time. You don't know what's happening. And uh, the caller, the human callers don't have an idea of what's going on. So the experience is not very natural for them. One more uh, important problem with this is that with RoboKiller, uh, evasive robocallers cannot be stopped. One of the reasons is currently uh, most of the robocallers, and I guess you have noticed this as well, when you pick it up, uh, they don't say anything unless you say anything. So once you pick up and say hello or anything else, then they'll start speaking. So with the audio analysis techniques that RoboKiller is using, these types of robocallers cannot be stopped. So we were the first ones uh, to build a deep learning based system to combat unwanted robocalls. Uh, our virtual assistant uses deep learning tools and techniques to make the decision of whether it's an unwanted call or a wanted call. We have developed a proof of concept app. We named it Robocall Guard and showed that it was able to block 100% of the mass robocalls and it was able to label 90, almost 98% of the robocalls correctly. We conducted a user study to measure the usability of our virtual assistant. And uh, later I'll show uh, what, what the results of the user study look like. Uh, but most, most users reported that they wanted such a virtual assistant and they were comfortable in having a virtual assistant uh, intervening their call and filtering unwanted calls on behalf of them. Now to give a brief idea of how the virtual assistant works, so with uh, when a call comes, the first thing the virtual assistant is going to do is make a preliminary decision based on the caller ID. So all whitelisted calls are going to be passed to the user immediately. So let's say uh, phone calls, uh, fo calls from phone numbers that are in your contact list, let's say your family members or your friends, they're going to be passed to you immediately. They don't have to go to the virtual assistant every time they call you. Blacklisted calls uh, are, are going to be dropped. However, uh, unknown calls, phone numbers that were not seen before or that are not in either whitelist or blacklist are gonna be picked up by the virtual assistant. And the virtual assistant is gonna greet them and ask a simple question, which is, who are you trying to reach? And the intuition here is someone who is calling you and who knows who they're calling or who knows your name, it's, more, it's most likely that uh, it is a want, wanted call. However, with mass robocalls, these calls are not targeted. They don't know your name, they randomly, or, or they have a pool of very large destination phone numbers they want to reach, and they want to reach as many people in as less time as possible. So they won't be able to provide a correct name. 
So if a correct name is detected, the call is forwarded. However, if a correct name is not detected, then the virtual assistant uh, makes a decision whether if this unwanted call is, uh, is from a human caller or from a robocaller. And to make that decision, we use a simple yet effective technique, which is interrupting the caller. So when uh, the intuition behind this is that when a human is interrupt, uh, interrupted, it's more likely that uh, they're going to stop, although flap, and we do take care of that. However, when a human is interrupted, they're going to stop to listen to you. On the other hand, with this mass robocallers, once they start to play their recording, uh, there's no stopping. So if a caller is interrupted, uh, we label it as a blocked or we label it as an unwanted human caller. If not, we label it as an unwanted robocaller. So a bit about the threat model, <coughs> excuse me. So our virtual assistant is able to stop or very effective against mass robocalls. It's uh, mass unwanted live calls from humans like telemarketers or debt collectors, people who don't know your name. It's effective against spoof calls because it's not uh, relying on a blacklist totally or a whitelist totally. And then it is also uh, effective against uh, AI equipped attack like uh, Google Duplex when the attack is untargeted. However, uh, the virtual assistant, uh, the threats that are out of scope for the virtual assistant is targeted attack. So attacks where they actually know who the person they're calling are not gonna be able to, uh, there, I mean, the virtual assistant is not going to be able to stop that. And uh, landline calls are not in our scope as well. Now, let me talk a little bit about our system architecture. Now, with every incoming call, the first thing that happens or the first module that uh, takes place is the call interceptor. And there is the whitelist, blacklist in the call interceptor. And uh, the call interceptor makes the preliminary decision based on the whitelist or in the blacklist if it's from a whitelist uh, the call is forwarded uh, if it's from a blacklist the call is hung up all the uh, calls from unknown callers are passed to the spam detector module and there are three components in the spam detector module so all the calls coming to the spam detector module uh, all the audio recordings are transcribed and the transcriber takes care of that and uh, after asking the question, when the virtual assistant asked the question who you were trying to reach, the response recognizer module determines whether the correct name was said or not. If the correct name was said, the call is passed to the user with transcript. If not, then the robocall detector module determines whether it's a, whether if it's an unwanted robocaller or an unwanted human caller, and uh, it labels it at, uh, accordingly and saves it for saves the recording and the transcript for the user and provides a notification to the user as well. Now to give some more details about each component, uh, as I've mentioned, the call interceptor module is the first module that comes uh, in place and it makes an initial decision based on the caller ID. Uh, it, it intercepts the call to acquire the incoming audio stream and then injects voice messages by the virtual assistant in the outgoing audio stream. With the response recognizer, this is the module that decides whether this call is wanted or not, and uh, it decides whether the correct name was said or not. Now, the correct name can be set by the user. So when the user is installing or setting up this uh, app or virtual assistant, they can uh, set up their correct name or names. Uh, they can include names of their family members as well. And we use a keyword spotting algorithm to detect whether the correct name was said or not. Now, there are multiple commercial uh, keyword spotting algorithm available, and we tried with a bunch of them, and we ended up with using Snowboy. One of the reasons is that Snowboy is very lightweight, so we can actually use it in a mobile device. Is It uses a deep neural network-based uh, model to detect whether uh, the keyword was spotted or not. And uh, it has a decent performance or a good performance when trained with names, human names. And uh, it can be trained with very limited audio recordings. And uh, 
the advantage of this is that when we are asking the user to provide the audio recordings of them saying the name, it's not feasible to ask them to provide like hundreds of recording to train the model. However, with Snowboy, uh, only three audio recordings are needed to build a model and use that to detect whether the correct name was said or not. Now the robocall detector module uh, decides whether uh, the caller was interrupted or not. After the VA interrupts the caller at a predefined time, we use voice activity detection or VAD to determine if the caller actually became silent or not. If they were interrupted, we label them as an unwanted human caller. If not, then we uh, label them as an unwanted robocaller. And uh, the transcriber module, as I've mentioned before, takes care of the transcription. And uh, there were some things or some challenges that we had to overcome while building this module. Ideally, we wanted our virtual assistant application or, or the robocall guard application to be embedded in the phone app itself. So we wanted to transcribe locally. And there are packages or libraries provided by Android where you could do transcription locally. However, there are some restrictions like uh, you cannot use, I mean, you can only use the microphone as an input channel and you cannot use an incoming audio stream uh, as an input for locally transcribing uh, your audio. Hence, we took another, we took an alternate approach and we used a Google Cloud Speech API, which also uses deep learning to transcribe. It's an ASR system, which has a very high accuracy and transcription can be uh, done from a mobile device. As I've mentioned, uh, we assistant to be embedded in the phone app. However, due to these challenges uh, and the restrictions from Android, one of them was, as I mentioned, uh, transcribing locally. We did come across some challenges. And then uh, the other big challenge was when we wanted to embed our virtual assistant in the phone app, uh, and there were Android restrictions on injecting voice message in the outgoing audio stream. So therefore, we, uh, we built a proof of concept VoIP application. And uh, we implemented our virtual assistant in such a VoIP application, it's like WhatsApp which can be installed by two users to make a phone call. And we use that application to conduct our user study experiment to evaluate how the user experience is when there is a virtual assistant acting as a middleman filtering their calls. Now we conducted a user study on 21 users. And we set up the user study in a way that both all the users had to play the role of both the caller and the callee. And we took a pair of users, one of them acted as caller, one of them acted as the callee, and they made phone calls and the caller had to interact with the virtual assistant before reaching the callee. And this uh, graph shows uh, some of the responses to the survey questions that we asked to both the caller and the callee. Most of the callers said uh, or agreed that it was easy to interact with the virtual assistant. And since uh, we, introduce a, we introduce the virtual assistant as a middleman, which uh, alters the typical phone call experience, there is going to be some delay in uh, reaching the callee because the caller has to interact with the virtual assistant first and then go reach the callee. So we asked them if the delay they experienced before the other person responded is uh, acceptable or not. And most of them did say that uh, they either agreed, strongly agreed, or, or they were neutral about the delay. Now, about the transcript, the quality of the transcript, or, or more the importance of the transcript, we asked the colleagues whether if the transcript was able to provide sufficient information. And uh, we did this for both, uh, since transcript is forwarded for or transcript is shown to the user for both blocked and forwarded calls. We did this for both blocked and forwarded calls. And uh, for the ones, for the calls that were blocked, most of the users agreed that the transcript was able to provide sufficient information about the content of the blocked calls. Uh, and three except all users said that the transcript was able to provide sufficient information about the calls that were forwarded. Now, the reason three users didn't agree with this is because when uh, the caller was asked to say the correct name, they just said the name and then nothing else. So that 
the transcript only consisted of the name. Since uh, we cannot control what the caller says, so in this case, these three callers uh, disagreed that the transcript was able to provide sufficient information. We also asked some generic questions to both callers and colleagues about their experience in using this virtual assistant-like system. Most of them said that the virtual uh, that the virtual assistant was beneficial because it provides prior knowledge about incoming calls and that they would like to use an app uh, equipped with the virtual assistant frequently and that they were uh, comfortable in the virtual assistant intervening their phone calls. We also tested our virtual assistant's effectiveness in stopping robocalls. So we uh, we had uh, about 8,000 or more than 8,000 uh, real robocalls coming to a telephony honeypot. Now, these calls were uh, collected in 2018. Uh, we performed topic modeling and DB scan clustering methods to, out, uh, to filter out the outliers and the noise and uh, create 79 clusters of real robocalls. We took one robocall from each cluster and made calls to the virtual assistant and 100% of the mass robocalls were detected or blocked. And uh, almost 98% of the robocalls were labeled correctly. Now to conclude, uh, Robocall Guard is very effective against uh, mass robocalls, and uh, it can provide the benefit. It can provide the benefit to the callees of filtering out the unwanted or spam calls on behalf of them without making the phone ring all the time from these spam calls, and it can provide the convenience to the to the callees that they can actually have some idea about uh, the call content before picking up the call. And stop unwanted non-targeted live calls from human callers like telemarketers and debt collectors as well. In our user study, we made some of the callers uh, pretend to be a telemarketer and gave them a script to talk to the virtual assistant. And the virtual assistant blocked all the calls from these uh, telemarketer uh, telemarketers. To our user study, we have showed that user experience is preserved. One of our key design goals was to preserve user experience and not uh, alter the typical phone experience by a lot. However, there are some limitations. As I've mentioned, uh, Robocall Guard is not able to protect users against targeted attacks. With current uh, leakage of private data where name and phone number association can be leaked, uh, attackers can get the name and phone number association and provide the correct name when asked. So currently we're working on this in our future work uh, where our virtual assistant is gonna be able to protect against such targeted or more sophisticated robocallers as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, I'd greatly appreciate any feedback or any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, uh, Shabarni. Um, so uh, while, while others are thinking, I have a one quick question, uh, mostly about a fault, potential false positives. So for example, when uh, some pharmacy uh, or my hospital call me, Sometimes they mispronounce my names quite often. Uh, I was wondering, have you considered this uh, name recognition and how tolerant against, you know, user accent uh, or potential mispronunciations for, you know, non-standard English names, for example? That's a very good question, and uh, we we do have thought about that. One of the limitations uh, of this work is that it is currently dependent on a keyword spotting algorithm for, for the names. Uh, we tested with some names, although we haven't tested with, it's not possible to test with all the names, but we do did test it with some English and non-English names. And uh, Snowboy does perform decently, but there are instances where uh, it is not able to pronounce uh, or it is not able to detect correctly. In the user study, we have seen that in two or three cases, uh, Snowboy was not able to detect the first time the caller said the name and uh, the caller had to repeat the name before uh, their call was forwarded. So that is one of the limitations in this work and currently in our future work, we are uh, trying to work on that. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's see if we have more questions. Um, 
other than that, maybe we can uh, conclude this session in that case. Uh, thank you again so much for the great talk. Uh, and uh, I think the next stop is the launch break. But Lorenzo and Nicholas, if you have announcement to make, you know, please go ahead. Um, no, I guess there's there's no announcement other than uh, thank you all so far and uh, enjoy your lunch break. So we're going to be seeing each other in an hour uh, at 12.30 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific time uh, with the second keynote. And then after that, we're going to have um, uh, second uh, the, the second session, then a break, and then our panel. All right, so I'll just be keeping some slight looping if I can here and some sound track music to soothe your souls. Uh, but other than that, you know, just, just go feel free to grab a cup of coffee or something. All right, uh, see you in an hour. Bye.